This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural text today comes from the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, chapter 22, verses 5 through 8. Notice here, stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther, and we will worship there. And then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. Today we're speaking from the subject, the power of altars. The power of altars. This is a place here where Abraham and his son are going up Mount Moriah to make this sacrifice that God has required of Abraham. And it is God's way of testing Abraham's character, really not so much proving it to God, but helping Abraham to have confidence in the God who trusts in him. God already knew who Abraham was and what he would do, but sometimes you don't always know the full dimensions of your own self until you're tested and tried. There are people that said, you know, if I were you, if I were in this situation, I would do thus and so. Sometimes, no, you don't know what you would do until you get into that situation. God already knows. It's never a surprise to him. So I think that God was really revealing and unveiling to Abraham the strength of character that was already in him. The righteous resolve when he was asking him to do something uh, against the grain of what he even believed would be right or that God would ever require. But God asked him to see, would he be faithful to obey him because what God was going to trust Abraham to do was going to need his obedience and not merely his questioning. Because God will sometimes tell you about things in your future that you don't understand at the moment, but you have to trust that he knows. And there are things that will happen in your life. You don't understand why this is happening right now, but God, I trust you. God, I trust you you. And this is where Abraham was. He builds an, uh, an altar. He has to build an altar. And he's going on a journey and he's taking his son uh, with him. And he's teaching his son almost a certain reliance upon God because they're going up there. They got everything for the sacrifice except the sacrifice. And Abraham assuredly tells his son when his son asks him, where's where the sacrifice? And he says, God's going to provide it. And little did he know that the plan at the, at the time was that if he doesn't provide it, you're, you're it. You're it. And uh, God only tells us what we need to know at the time. But here's uh, some things that I want you to notice about the elements that were a part of the altar and the sacrifice. I want you to notice the elements that were part of this, uh, this altar and the sacrifice. The wood, which was a source for, for the fuel for the fire. And I'm glad that um, Abraham, as a father had his son to carry the wood. That's the heaviest part. Uh, you have to have a source for your fuel. It's like getting ready to barbecue and you don't have any wood and you don't have any charcoal. You've got to have a source for the, for the fire. Then the fire itself. Now, Abraham took the fire. Uh, I guess that's pretty easy to, to carry. I don't know whether he was carrying something that, uh, a flame that was already lit in something or whether the, the utensils in order to actually spark the fire. But Abraham carried the fire, which this has to be your passion, your power uh, to consume the sacrifice. And then Abraham also carried the knife. The knife is to cut off what should no longer live to hinder us. You got to have something that cuts off what shouldn't hinder you. Remember, that's what a decision does. 
A decision literally means decision. De means off. Sis means to cut. Shan means the state of. A decision is a state of cutting off. Every time you make a decision, you're cutting off other opportunities of things that could hinder you and destroy you in your future. You want to make a decision that blesses your future, not one that hinders you, hampers you, or sets you back. But then there's another element in this. It is the gap. It is the gap, which is the place for God to provide the miraculous. Whenever God is dealing with you, God will give you a dream, God will give you a vision, but God will always leave a gap. He will always leave a gap. I don't care how well you try to plan things out, God will always leave a gap. Every time that I stand up to minister, I don't ever, if, if somebody ever, you know, if I read through my notes, you could read through my notes in less than five minutes. I always purposefully leave gaps for God to speak to me, to interrupt, to say, God, this is not my, not my will, but thine be done. Not my thoughts, God. Your thoughts are the ones that bring liberty and blessing to your people. I always leave gaps. My notes are always full of gaps so that I can depend upon God to fill in the gap. A gap is a place where you allow God to be able to fill it. There's a space almost in every cell and they can't even understand what holds these things together. There's an invisible gap. It speaks of the very presence of God himself. God specializes in the gap. I like to call the gap the God factor. That God will give you a dream and he'll tell you, to tell a, a Pharaoh to let my people go. He speaks to Moses and says, let my people go. But there was a gap about the Red Sea. He didn't tell him that there was going to be a Red Sea. When he, when he left Egypt, he had no idea that he was going to deal with that kind of a gap. That was a huge, that you got a wide gap to cross a big ocean of people and you got nearly three million people with you and you've got to get over the gap. How do I get over this? That's the God factor. That is the God factor. Remember when Elijah the prophet uh, was dealing with Ahab, he was dealing with the 450 uh, prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. He dealt with a different situation where he already took the wood and he had the sacrifice, but his gap was that he had no fire. And he had to call down fire from heaven, and that was the gap for Elijah. Everybody's gap is different. Your gap might be a lack of money to do what God has told you to do. Somebody else's gap is a lack of manpower. Somebody else's gap is a, is a lack of this technical skill that you might need. But God will always leave a gap. It is God's unique way of writing himself into the script of your life. And so he's saying to you, you must depend upon me. And never will forget traveling over in Europe and getting ready to board the train. There was, a, there was a, a, a notice there on the platform that says, mind the gap. Mind the gap. Because there was a little gap between the platform and you're actually stepping onto the train. They didn't want anybody to step down and get part of a shoe or heel or something caught between the gap of the platform and the train. So they said, mind the gap. But let me just tell you, it is God who minds this gap. This is a space for the supernatural, for the holy to work in your life. God will always create a space. I don't care whether it's a husband and wife, there's going to be a gap where you say, Lord, I've talked to them and I've done everything that I know to do. God deal with them. Lord, I've dealt with these children in the name of Jesus. He will always create a situation bigger than what you have, the power, the know-how, the, the means, the, the understanding to be able to deal with. It is God's way of saying, that's the gap. And I am writing myself in it because you've got to get over this. And, and I didn't even tell you about this gap, but the gap is there so that you can trust me. Because when God gave Joseph a dream, he told Joseph nothing about the fact that his brothers would betray him and put him down a, a, in, in a pit and plot to kill him. They had told him nothing about Potiphar's wife who would tell a lie on him and would cause him to wind up in jail. The only thing that he knew is that he was going to be in a ruling, reigning position and that all of his family members were going to come and be subservient to him but God never showed him the pit God never showed him the prison God only showed him the palace those were gaps that God intentionally left in the program because when God designs a program for your life when he has written out the script for your life he will never show you all of the problems God talks about the promise not the problem he doesn't want you to have faith in the problem he wants you to have faith in the promise so he doesn't talk to you about the gap. Let God mind the gap. 
The gap is for God to be able to do it. The Lord will provide. You will all come to your place of where you will come to that understanding. And this is the first time in the revelation of mankind that God began to reveal himself as Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. The Lord my provider. He will provide. Where is the sacrifice, Dad? The Lord will provide. He was speaking prophetically when he had nothing else. But little did Isaac know that he was the backup plan. And isn't it amazing that when we have gaps, we always have a a backup plan. But if this doesn't ever work out, I go home and stay with my mama. We always always have a backup plan. There's some, yeah, I can always sell my car. We've always got some kind of little flimsy backup plan. But it's never what God had in mind. So I just want you to realize that God will speak to you about things and there will be a gap in between the promise And where you are right now, in front of every prophetic promise, there is always a problem. That problem is called a gap. And so here, Abraham was going up Mount Moriah to make this sacrifice. And he had the wood, and he had the fire, everything that he needed to build the altar, but he had no sacrifice. And God would make himself known up on top of Mount Moriah as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider or the Lord will provide. Here's the deal. The sacrifice was already caught in the thickets. The problem is Abraham couldn't see it because he was fixated on what he was losing instead of what God had provided. And when you are more fixated on your problem than on God's provision... God, my provider, to provide literally comes from a Latin word, provider, which means to see before. When you provide, it means that you see a need before you have the need and you fill the need. Before God ever thought about replacing, uh, multiplying people in the earth, you know, he, he thought about putting a seed inside of the man and the woman to be able to reproduce. He already thought about that. He already had it in mind. So that when a little girl is born, she has all of the eggs that she'll ever have already in her ovaries. Her body doesn't manufacture eggs. She's got everything that she'll ever need. God has already provided. He's a provider. He sees the need before we have the need, and then he provides it. And just understand that, that when God gives you a vision, the provisions are already there for it. Jesus had a future, and no wonder that when, the, when the, uh, the kings of Orient, when these wise men came, guess what they were bringing? Gold. What in the world do you need gold for as a baby, uh, coming to a baby shower? Gold is money. They was, he was bringing the provision before he ever saw what he would ever need. Frankincense. This is a, a, a thing of worth and value. It was something that you traded. It had worth and value. Who brings f- uh, perfume to a baby shower? This was provision. And you've got to see that if God is sending you provision, it's for something that you're going to need down the road. He's already providing it and you don't even see it. And if you've got more provision than what you have vision, the result is waste. It is abuse. It is misuse. Because you have more provision than you have vision. But remember, provision is always for the vision. When God gives provision, it's for the vision. But mind the gap. Mind the gap. Let God mind the gap. There will always be gaps in the program or the agenda of whatever God has given to us. There's always going to be a gap. There's always going to be a gap. Now, I want you to notice uh, the, the whole power here of altars, about building an altar and what it does. Notice in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 24. Notice this. Build for me an altar made of earth and offer your sacrifices to me, your burnt offerings and peace offerings, your sheep and goats, your cattle. Build my altar wherever I cause my name to be remembered or honored and I will come to you and bless you. Now this is the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament dispensation now. We have a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, under the old covenant, God says, build me an offer and, and offer unto me burnt offerings and sacrifices. Bring those things to me, sheep and goats and cattle. He doesn't ask us for those things today, but he says, build my altar and wherever I cause my name to be remembered. 
Where, you know, I'll cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and I will bless you. He says, if you build an altar, an altar is a spiritual place that you build in your own heart of where you reverence the name of the Lord. You honor God's name. You honor his memory. You honor what God has already done in your life. That's building that altar. And he says, if you build that altar, I will come there and I will bless you. An altar is a place of blessing. He says, if you will build that altar, I will come and bless it. Now, this is the Old Testament. We got a new one, a better one. He says, not only am I going to come there, I'll tabernacle with you. I will live with you. That's better than to have God to just visit you every now and then. He says, I will tabernacle with you. I, I'm going to live there with you. So our altar today is that place that we come to remember God and to honor him in our own heart. And it becomes a sanctified place. And that's why you can be in your shower and that shower becomes your altar. You can be singing. You can be thinking about the goodness of Jesus. You can be singing his praises and that shower becomes your altar. Some people while they're in the bathroom sitting on their throne, that becomes their altar where they talk to Jesus. They have their, a little talk with Jesus. For another person, it might be their laundry room where they're washing and drying clothes. They may be standing over a sink and that may be their altar while you're bussing suds in a sink. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? And you're talking to Jesus and that is your altar. And somebody might just think that you're in there cleaning the kitchen, but no, 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 this is an altar. This is an altar where something is happening down in my soul and I'm thinking about the goodness of Jesus. The old slave women as they did that, they'd be humming things that they were in so much pain sometime that they couldn't even articulate it in a prayer and it had to come out in a groan in a moan in just humming the hymns of something and God was able to translate that as a prayer directly from that particular altar that they were building in that place that came up before his throne but he says wherever you remember me you build an altar and he says in honor my name I will come there and I will bless you I will come there and I will bless you. It is a promise of God if you will build an altar, a place of remembrance where you will honor the name of the Lord. God says, I will come there and I will bless you. I will come there and I will bless you. I will come there and I will bless you. They said it this way in the field of dreams. You build it and they will come. God says, if you will build it, I will come there and I will bless you. God said it before they said it. If you build the altar, I will come there and I will bless you. If, if you build it, I'll come there and I will bless you. If you ever make a place for God, I declare to you, God will come. Give him a room in your heart. He will come. Make a room in your house. God will come. If you invite him into your car, he will come. On the bus, he will come. In the train, he will come. In the closet, he will come. God will come wherever you will make room for him to come. He will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Now, here are some key elements that the altars provide for us today. Some key elements. Number one, acceptance. Acceptance. The altar is a place of acceptance. We're accepted in the beloved when we come as, uh, on the, to the altar. Ephesians chapter 1, notice verse 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, I want you to just notice there, he predestined us to adoption. It is God's way of saying, I chose to adopt you. When I was able to see you and know everything that there was to know about you, I knew your history. I knew your credit history. I knew your health history. And I chose to adopt you anyway. I wasn't just stuck with you when you were born in obscurity and didn't know what sex it was, didn't know what you were going to look like. When you adopt somebody, you know what they look like. You know the personality of the child. You know whether they are passive or aggressive. You know certain things. And Jesus says, I, I predestined you here and I've adopted you. As sons and daughters, I, I chose you, even knowing the best about you and the worst, I chose to love you anyhow. And, and that ought to make you feel special that we were chosen with his knowing the worst that there is to know about us. He chose us anyway. 
knowing the worst about it, he chose to know us. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That happened at the altar of the cross. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. He did that to give us a place of acceptance. The altar is a place of divine acceptance. Now here's what I want you to understand about acceptance. True acceptance is about acceptance of the current state of something or someone. But it is not giving up. It is not remaining in denial. Or it is not just letting go without action. I want you to think about how when, when, a, when a woman gives birth in a delivery room, she, she has a baby. She has to accept that baby in the condition that the baby is. Loves him unconditionally. But she doesn't just leave the baby like that. They clean the baby up. They feed the baby. They attend to the baby's needs. You know, they, they create a good environment for that child to be able to learn and to grow. You accept them as they are, but then action comes to, to, to bring us into another situation. True acceptance is a form of action and with action comes hope please understand that with action comes hope if you're ever feeling hopeless just get up and start moving get up and start moving some of your greatest ideas will come to you if you get up and go for a walk God has a tendency to help people when they are on the move if you're just sitting there just sitting just sitting put yourself in motion if you're sitting at home feeling sorry for yourself, depressed, get up and put your clothes on. Put your lashes on. Put your nails on. Put your hair on. But, listen, if, if you look better, you feel better. It's, there's something about the action that makes you feel better. I'm not telling you to do this to impress other people. Do it for you. Do it for you. Do it for you. It, just an action. If, you, if you're suffering with depression, get up and, and wash your face. Take a bath and put on a nice outfit. Don't just wait for somebody to come and take you out on a date. Do it for you. I'm just telling you. Look in the mirror and say, Ooh, you cute. Ooh. Talk to yourself. Do it for you. You will feel better. You'll feel better. Action brings hope. Action brings hope because if I had no hope in the action, I wouldn't do the action. The only reason that people get all duded up when it, before they go out on a date, because they're hoping to get some action. <laughs> they, they have hope, they have expectation in the action that something is going to happen as a result of this. Action has hope built into it. So whenever you do acceptance, acceptance of something, you say, you know what? I'm buying this house as is. It's run down. It's dilapidated. It needs paint. It needs renovation. It needs uh, fortifying on the foundation. But you start seeing the, the hope, the expectation of what this thing can be. So you fix up. When you have a fixer up, it takes a special eye to be able to see that because there's a lot of action that's going to have to go in that. The only reason that you do the action is because you've got hope. Hope is expectation of favorable change. It means that you're working on something, making this thing better. That's what happens when you accept something. You accept the house in the dilapidated condition in which it is. But you know what? It's like, I got some, I'm going to put a coat of paint on this. Oh, oh, we're going to put some new sheetrock in here. We're going to tear this out. We're going to modernize these bathrooms. We're getting ready to modernize this kitchen. Oh, yeah, this, oh, I'm going to turn this into a gold mine here. It is your action that it becomes a demonstration that you believe that something greater is coming. It's because when we feel hope, we feel motivated to move forward. And that's why you, you, the, the acceptance, our a very acceptance of it and says, you know what? I can do something with this. I can do something with this. I can do something with this. We got ready to recycle some stuff, and they said, no, no, we don't, we don't deal with styrofoam here. They dealt with plastic, they dealt with glass, but uh, we, we don't deal with styrofoam. So if they had no, no hope or expectation for it, then they, they, they couldn't even receive it. But if you see value in something, you, you, you accept it. Your acceptance says, we can do something with this. We can do something with it. They don't want to receive something to, to, to be, be recycled if you can't recycle it into something else. So they said, no, no, there's, there's no value here. We, we, we can't receive that. The moment that you're accepted, God says, I can do something with this. That's 
why he receives us when we come to, come to the altar. And he, and he doesn't turn us away. Because you see, it means when we accept it, we believe that better can happen with this. I accept it just as it is, just like he, he accepts us just as we are. God loves us just as we are. You don't have to do anything. God loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. Could the king of glory come into your life? Could he sneak into your life and nobody ever know it? I mean the king of glory, the creator of the ends of the earth. Could he come into your life? With all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his power, all of his righteousness and holiness, could he sneak into your life and live there totally undetected forever? Is it possible for God, who is our everything, to come into a life and nobody ever know it? I doubt it. And this is why he accepts us because he believes. And this is the only thing that he asks us to do is to just to believe in him. You see, just just to believe in him. Because to believe means to commit to. To believe means to commit to. When the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus, it says commit to the Lord Jesus. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a, a mental assenting to something. It is an action. Commit to. When you believe in, if you believe in your marriage, you commit to it. If you believe in your children, you commit to it. If you believe in your job and the mission, you commit to it. Real belief is committal to. It says, I'm committed to this. I am committed to this. And so Jesus accepts us without condition. That's why the altar is a tremendous place of acceptance. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 37. However, those that the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. I will never reject them. Notice that's acceptance. I will never reject them. I will never reject them. Do you know that they said that a lot of times guys won't approach really pretty girls? I mean, really, I mean, beauty queens because they're afraid of rejection. They go to a sort of a plain Jane. Hey, let me, let me holler at you. (laughs) But the more drop dead gorgeous they are, they're protecting their own little egos by saying, you know, she, she ain't going to pay me any attention. She's not going to pay me any, and they won't even approach her. And the pretty girl ends up over here by herself, of course, unless somebody's got some of that juice in them. (laughs) But oftentimes, they wind up rarely approached by people of quality because the most high quality person felt that I can't even get this person's attention. You don't ever know. It's, It's about... Having this kind of feeling just like that Jesus had that when they come to me, I'm I'm not going to reject them. And they don't know, find a need in their heart. They're looking for somebody kind. They're looking for somebody who can see them and not merely their external beauty. They're looking for somebody that knows how to value them, that has a respect and an honor. It's the way that you make a girl feel because that's why you can find a very average dude with a drop dead gorgeous woman and people will see you walk down the street and then they be saying, how in the world did he get up? (laughs) He knew how to say what she needed to hear. Men are seduced through their eyes, but women are seduced through their ears. And when she's told the types of things that minister to her, that fill a need, a void that is in her life, it, it, it supplies something. But Jesus said, I, I, I'm not going to reject you. He accepts us just as we are. Notice what the, the scripture says, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 through 30. He accepts us as we are, but he doesn't just leave us there. Notice this, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He says, come, come to me, come to me, but you're not going to stay as you are, you're going to learn. I'm so glad that he is the kind of God who loves us enough to teach us. He changes us. He teaches us through transformative ideas and understanding and the transformation that his incredible love does for us. So I notice what he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
says, you're going to learn something. I accept you as you are. Come unto me. Whatever your condition is, burned out, tired, broke, busted, and disgusted, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me, and I'm going to give you a rest from all of this stuff that you're trying to do to be good enough to be accepted. But the altar is the place where we are accepted in the beloved. Altar is the place that we are accepted in the beloved. Here's, here's the, the, as you can, may have figured out, this, this, this is an acronym. The A is acceptance. The L is love, love, love. And this is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the kind of God who loves us just because he is God. He loved us first while we were still unlovable. He loves us. God loves you. He loves you. He's not just in love with America for God so loved the the world. God loves Mexico. God loves El Salvador. I mean, he, he loves Venezuela. I mean, they can have problems and issues. God loves Brazil. Uh, God loves Cuba. God loves Russia. God loves China. For God so loved the, the world. He loves Africa. He loves Europe. He loves Asia. God so loved the, the world. He so loved the world. He's not a nationalist. He's a father who loves their children no matter where they would live. Can you imagine as a parent that you would love your children any less because you've got children living in Mexico and another child living in Europe? Can, I mean, really? Would, should that diminish your love for your children just because of where they live? No, no, no. You're going to love your children if you've got a child in California and one in New York, and even if you, even if you don't want to live there. So God loves us for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his son to redeem us and to provide for us this thing that we call eternal life. Eternal life. And here's the great clincher that I want you to get. When Jesus came and gave himself to us, it was not that we had to labor in order to do anything. It's just responding to God's own love for us. You do not have to beg God. You do not have to bargain with God. And you do, not have, you do not have to bribe God. You only have to believe Him. He's only asked us to simply believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Confess your heart. Just believe on Him. Believe on Him. You don't have to beg Him. You don't have to bargain with him. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. You do, you, you. No, no, you don't have to bargain with God. You don't have to bribe him. I'm going to give you my tithes. I'll pay my tithes. That's, you can't buy salvation. Salvation is not for sale. You can't bargain with him. You can't bribe him into that. He simply says, believe me, God's greatest need is to be believed. Commit to me. Commit to me. Believe me. Believe me. Believe me. Believe what? Believe that he's already provided your salvation and that your salvation is not based on your performance but his promise. Understand that your salvation is not based on your goodness but his grace. Understand that your salvation is not based on your merit but his mercy. God has already provided in love to us. Mercy is God's unfailing love toward us. It is a love response, and we find that love at the altar where he made the greatest sacrifice of all. It is a place of acceptance. It is a place of love. Thirdly, the altar is a place of transfer and transformation. It is a place of transfer and transformation. Notice the Bible in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you and let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind that he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think and then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect We present our bodies to God. There's a divine transfer. We give him our sin, he gives us his righteousness. 
We give him our filth, he gives us his cleansing. It, it's, it's a place of transfer. We transfer all of our unworthiness, all of our sick sin, all of our sickness, all of our darkness on him. And he gives us light and he gives us love and he gives us healing and he gives us deliverance. It's a place of divine transfer. The altar is a place of transfer and transformation. Transformation. You change how you believe things in your core. I want you to understand the difference here between change and transformation. Change is primarily a response to external influences where one modifies behavior to achieve desired results. That's, that's just change. That, that's, that's caused by external responses. Somebody, you know, is, is threatened and they don't want to lose their job, they straighten up. They, they change, but they're not transformed. See, that's by external uh, influences, external influences, you see? I mean, one father was trying to discipline his son and, uh, you know, he was in a meeting and his little boy just kept on talking to his friend. And, uh, and, and not only was he talking to his friend, but he, he, he kept, you know, he just, children won't be still. He just got him. He was standing up. And his dad leaned over to him. He said, boy, if you get up one more time, I'm going I'm to tear your hide up. And, and the little boy leaned over to his friends and he said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. You see, he was changed, but he wasn't transformed. See, change, let, let's just look at it again. Change is primarily, it is primarily a response to external influences where one modifies behavior to achieve desired results. Now let's look at transformation. Transformation is about modifying core beliefs that impact long-term behaviors that bring glory to God. You see, so when you get transformed, it's because something has happened in your core belief system that I know that God has delivered me from this addiction that I had and I cannot go back to that. If I go back to that, I will die. It becomes a core belief in you that I'm, I'm going to please God. I, I cannot go back to this kind of living. God has transformed me from that. I can never live on that level again. I've been transformed. I've grown now. I've come into a new understanding. I've been transformed by his power. His word has transformed me. His spirit has changed even my desires on the inside. That's an in, inner work. That's an, an inner governor that is happening on the inside. That's an inner thermostat that is controlling your temperature. You're no longer responding to the temperature from the outside. You now are creating a different temperature on the inside. That's the difference. Change is a thermometer, but uh, transformation is a thermostat. It's a thermostat. If one of them changes the outside thing. It responds, it, you know, when you're dealing with change, that's just responding to external influences. But uh, a, a thermostat is an internal thing. An automobile has a thermostat in it that keeps it from overheating. And if your thermostat is broken, your car is going to be boiling over all the time. It keeps things at the right cool. So no matter what people say to you, I have an internal thermostat. And, and your, your attitude is not going to spoil my day. That's your attitude. And you can keep that, you know, so that's, that's yours. So you have, to, you have to keep control of your own thermostat. Don't hand people your thermostat. Don't walk around with your thermostat in your hand because people will manipulate it. And so you have to realize that when we come to the altar, it is a place of transfer and transformation that deals with the core in your heart because you realize that I was blind, but now I see. I cannot go back to that. I know what it's like to be bound. I know what it's like to be in darkness. But now he has set me free. He's, I, I see the light. Now, never again, never again, never again. I'll never crawl around in the dirt again. He's now given me wings. It is what happens to a caterpillar as he spins its own cocoon. When he comes out, he's gone through a metamorphosis. He's had a change. And that caterpillar, after it has come out of its cocoon, and emerges as a butterfly, will never ever crawl on the earth again. Their mode of transportation changes. And how you get around and how you do things changes when you've had a transformation that happened at an altar. That changes us. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's a trading place. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We just trade places. We trade. Jesus traded places with us. 
The wages of sin is death. He took our penalty for sin and died in our place as us and substituted that. And he transferred his holiness and his righteousness onto us and he took our sin. Jesus gave us an impartation of who he is. The word impart comes from a Greek word, metadidomy. Metadidomy, when there's an impartation, metadidomy. Meta means change, didomy means to give. Metadidomy means to give change. Whenever a seed goes into the ground, it is imparted into the ground, into the soil. Whenever a sperm goes into an ovum, uh, it, it, it imparts change, transformation happens. It, it gives change to it. The moment that a sperm strikes an ovum, immediately, guess what happens? Division. But it is not division to make it odds with one another. It's division for multiplication. Because what starts off as one ovum, one egg cell, now turns into two and four and eight and 16 and 32 and 64 and 128 and 256 and 512 and 1024. It starts multiplying because of impartation, impartation, impart. It gives change. When the Spirit of God has been imparted into a human heart, it gives change. It changes how you feel about things. It changes desires. It changes your cravings because of a divine impartation. You begin to come out of an experience because of an impartation. Not because you came to church. Not because you watched something online. But when you get an impartation of the Holy Ghost. Listen, there's a difference, a huge difference between information and transformation and some are just dealing in information but it is the Holy Ghost that brings the transformation you don't you're not transformed just because you were exposed to new in information it, it's a power of the work of the Holy Spirit that's that God factor there's that gap that is there you can give out information all day and people will not be changed doctors do it all the time teachers do it all the time and people walk out with great information and unchanged the Surgeon General puts on every pack of cigarettes that this is harmful to your health and they keep smoking because we are not transformed by information. The Holy Ghost is not an information dealer. He's a transformation dealer. The altar is a place of transfer. It'll transfer onto you, transmit onto you, impart into you the transformative power that gives change, that gives change, that causes transformation. That's why if any man, if any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation transformed by the miracle power of God. That's transformation that happens. That's transformation. The altar is a place of acceptance. The altar is a place of love. The altar is a place of transfer and transformation. Let's move on to the next one, number four. It is a place of access and acceleration. Access and acceleration. Jesus said in St. John 14, 6, he said, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says, I'm the access point. He said, if you, if you, don't, if you don't deal with me, you, you can't go straight to the, to the Father. He said, you got to come through me. It's an access point. Do you know that the altar is it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a password. You're trying to get into a, 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 a program and you don't have the password. You're trying to get into an app and you don't have the, it's password protected. And, and, and he says, I'm, I'm the access point. Jesus said, I am the door. And if you come by any other way, you're a thief and a robber. Because Jesus is the legitimized access point through which we access God and heaven and all of its resources. And that's why Jesus said that whatever you ask in my name, you got to come through me. He says, it is by, by my access. And listen, here's the great thing about it. If you do it on your own, it'll take you a long time. But if you have access to someone, they also serve as an accelerator. So it won't take you as long to do it because you have access. 
when you know the when you have access to relationships because when you don't know anybody you got to fill out these forms and then mail this back in and in six weeks you know we will send you a reply and let you know and after that you'll fill out another a, 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 a file on, online and then we will process that and in another three months we will assess that and let you know but when you know the boss's dad uh, son or their grandchild that access accelerates the process access accelerates the process that's why if you got access it causes acceleration in your life it won't take you 10 and 20 years to do it I know it took them 20 but if you got access to a mentor it cuts the learning curve in half it will ship I mean that all of the time that they've spent doing that if you got access to a mentor it cuts your learning curve it takes you too long to figure this thing out to reinvent the wheel. You got to build on previous uh, technology. That's why, I mean, Elon Musk, I mean, he's brilliant, but he didn't start there with all of that himself. Uh, he studied stuff that N Nikola Tesla had developed. That's why the call is, is called a Tesla because this man built electric cars when 50% of the automobiles back in the early 1900s were electric vehicles. He didn't come up with something new. He built on something where the curve had already been shortened. That's what expert means, expediri. It means to shorten the curve, the learning curve, the distance. So when you have access to the great I am, who is omniscient and omnipotent and ubiquitous, when you have access to the one that knows everybody that you want to know and everybody that you need to know, God can call the very person that you've been trying to get in touch with for you to bump in line with them in the grocery store or they have a flat tire on the side of the road and you stop by there and it happened to be a person that's in a position to be able to grant you and take you to your next level and you didn't even understand how God was working things out that your child and that child on the same little league team and he said, listen, this is not an accident. This is not a coincidence. I'm giving you access and I have manipulated circumstances situations and timelines to be able to cause you to have a cataclysmic encounter one with another so that my divine purpose could be revealed and I'm accelerating your destiny it's amazing it's amazing it's amazing the altar is a place of access and acceleration when you know Jesus he'll help you get more done in less time I declare to you I'm telling you, time is winding up. And I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but this concentrical force of whenever something is winding up and winding up, as it gets down to the bottom, it starts swirling faster and faster and faster and faster. And while years ago, it took vaccine dozens of years to be developed. My, 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 somebody is seeing where I'm going here. As you can see, if you've got access to technology and data and analysis and previous things, it helps you to figure out earlier. Are you listening? I'm just here to tell you, God is a divine accelerator. He's a divine accelerator. It's not going to take you as long. This is not a key to give you impatience, a license to be impatient, but it's saying, wait on the Lord and God will make it up in less time. God will allow you to be able to do it in weeks what took other people years to do. I'm just here to tell you today that if you get access by an altar, it will accelerate your destiny and your purpose in him. Access, acceleration. It's amazing. Let's go to number five. Reconciliation and repentance. Reconciliation and repentance. Revelations chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. I mean, the Lord was willing to give crazy wild Jezebel an opportunity to repent. Notice this. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. He talked about this, the church there that had all of these great things, but he says, I got something, one thing against you. He says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by teaching, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And I want you to understand this. Jezebel is not, is not just a woman. It's a spirit. They are male Jezebels. Jezebel is a spirit of manipulation and control. Manipulation and control. It's, it's, not, it's not defined by a, a gender. 
It's a spirit. And there are male Jezebels. Like there are female Jezebels. So he's not talking about women here. He's talking about a spirit of manipulation. And he says this person that carried the spirit of manipulation here. I even gave that person an opportunity to repent. But they were unwilling. And see, the altar is a place to recognize that we were wrong. And it drives us with the conviction in our hearts to repent. It's a place of reconciliation where you're made friends again with God. And when you come into wonderful repentance. The Bible teaches us to repent. The world teaches us to tolerate. If you're wrong, it's, God is not just saying just tolerate all of the wrong. He said, no, no, no. That's why there's an altar so you can get to a place and get right. You can get to a place and get right. I, I don't want to... Because if I tolerate you, you'll never change what you're willing to tolerate. You will never change what you're willing to tolerate. You can't force people into it, but you can't change what you're willing to tolerate. And God says, that's the purpose of the altar. The, the, the altar, it's, it's not, God is not saying, I, I, I've, I've learned that people are different. Some people will receive me and some won't, so I'm going to just tolerate sin. No, 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 God has never tolerated sin. Not in times past, not in times present, nor, nor will he do it in the time in the future. That's why he's got an altar. We have to go to an altar and confess our sins. We go to an altar. That's a, that's a part of the redemptive work at the altar. It's a place of reconciliation. I never will forget a number of years ago, I was in a church down in South Georgia. And the Holy Spirit gave me a message that was so unpopular. He changed my message on my way to speak. I, I didn't want to speak on this, but it, it, he told me to speak on the subject of, un, uh, of unforgiveness. And it just wasn't exciting to me. I'm a teenage preacher. And I, and I go down to South Georgia, and I, I'm in the middle of the message, and the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon me. And I stand a woman up on the left side of the church and said, honey, stand up and come down and meet me at the altar. And then I stand up another lady at the right side of the church and said, meet me at the altar. And now I'm looking, and I've never been to this church before. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, there were huge families in this church. And this woman on the far left hand was an arch enemy to the woman on the far right side. And everybody in the church knew it but me. And now they're standing side by side at the altar. And I'm speaking as an oracle by the power of God. And I said, we're talking about God's incredible forgiveness today. And I said, I don't know what you two women have to do with one another. And everybody in the church knew they couldn't stand each other's guts. Had they had their nails on, they would have dug into each other's eyeballs. But yet, by the Spirit of God, he knew that they carried unforgiveness in their heart. And I said, you're here at the altar. And now you've got to make up whatever it is between you. I said, it must be released and forgiven. And both of the women broke down and cried. And they embraced and a healing revival broke out in that church by the power of forgiveness. At an altar! altar they had to get out of their seats they couldn't remain in their places of separation they had to come to the altar they met me at the altar and God confronted them with their sin not for them not to out them but to heal the families in there that had gotten into the family feuds and there was a church of feuding families and God healed them that day through a teenage boy who was willing to listen to the Holy Ghost and I declare to you I know experientially that God creates reconciliation and repentance and to see these two women weeping and embracing one another in front of the whole church it became a demonstration for them to be able to forgive out of their own hearts their own hurts their hang-ups their habits to release it out of their life and God could bring wholeness and healing to them because they were willing to forgive one another I've seen the power of the altar in action and the sixth thing is sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16. Our sacrifice, and this is the modern day sacrifice where it brings it to us, is to keep offering praise to God in the name of Jesus. But he says, but don't forget to help others and to share your possessions with them because this too is like a sacrifice that pleases God. I told you that God still honors sacrifice. God still honors sacrifice. And our sacrifice today is to keep offering praise to God in the name of Jesus.
keep offering praise in the name of Jesus. Keep the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. But he says it's not just verbal. It is also demonstrated through the sharing of your possessions with other people. He says this too is a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice yourself to help people. It's a sacrifice of your time, your energy, your efforts, your wisdom, your counsel, your resources. It's a sacrifice to help people. Remember here Gandhi's seven dangers to, to human virtue is wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, business without ethics, science without humanity, religion without sacrifice, and politics without principle. It's amazing. These are dangers to human virtue. And here a Hindu man could see that religion with no sacrifice was a danger to human virtue. There is no change without sacrifice because sacrifice involves giving up and all change involves loss. You got to lose something. If you're going to change, you got to lose the way you've been doing it. That's why people resist change because they don't want to lose how they've been doing things. But let me say this to you that if you're unwilling to be uncomfortable in the short term, you can never be faithful and pleasing to God in the long term. If you are unwilling to be uncomfortable in the short term, you can never be faithful and pleasing to God in the long term. And if you don't know what else to do, I love the words of Corey Ten Boom. When she said, look within and you'll be depressed. Look without and you'll be distressed. But look to Christ and you'll be at rest. It's amazing. When you're talking about the power of altars, this power of altars deals with the A, acceptance, the L, love, the T, transfer and transformation, the A, access and acceleration, the R, reconciliation and repentance, and the S, sacrifice. It is interesting that when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought up from the house of Obed Eden back into Jerusalem for David, King David went down with them and he was so excited, he danced out of his clothes. But the Bible says that when, when they took the Ark on their shoulders, when they were first leaving out of Obed Edom's house, and the Bible says that they went six paces, one, two, three, four, five, six. They stopped there and David built an altar and he offered sacrifices of sheep, goats to God after six paces, six paces. I wonder why six paces is because six is the number of men. Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day of creation. Man grows to be approximately six feet tall. When he dies, he's buried six feet under, carried by six pallbearers. The first book of the Bible named after a man was the sixth book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Because six is the number of man. It is so amazing what happens after they took six paces. David said, well, hold it, hold it. We can't just go on here as though nothing has happened. We must build an altar and we must remember the God who's been grateful, uh, faithful to us, who's been merciful to us. We must honor him. We must remember his name. And maybe today that we can't just literally take six steps and build an altar. But what happens is after every six days of labor, that seventh is the time that we come to remember. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And on this that we consider to be the Lord's day, we remember him. Our being here today, our tuning in today, this is our Sabbath. This is our altar to God where we, we reverence him, we remember him. And maybe we shouldn't wait six whole days before we remember God. And so I encourage you sometimes, you can build an altar. Remember, it's a place where you, you remember his name, where you honor his name. And I want you to know you can do that after every sixth activity of your day. If you just count your activities when you get up, you know, getting up in the morning, waking up in the morning, that's, that's number one. 
Then you go to the bathroom and you do your personal hygiene things there. That's, that's the second thing. Then you get your something to eat. That's the third. Then you get dressed for the day. That's the fourth. Then you go to school. You go to work. That's the fifth. Then you get there and you look at your agenda for the day. That's the sixth. And after that, Lord, I thank you. Build the altar. Build it into your day at different activities into the day. Sometimes when you really know Jesus and you really fall in love with Jesus, at any time of the day, you, you're liable to just break out. And you just, your thoughts fill with him. You can be washing clothes. You can be washing dishes. I can be on the treadmill. And he invades my thoughts. He invades my thoughts. I can be sitting down emailing somebody. And all of a sudden, it just swoops in on my thoughts. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's an altar. It's a sacred place and space and time where we reverence and honor the name of the Lord. It's, you don't build it today with woods. Wood. You don't do it with the wood. Lord, I would do this if I had more time. You don't build it with wood. You build it with will. You build it with honor, with reverence. In your, with thanksgiving. It is so sad in our world today that I see in most places now that serve meals that they sit down to eat and rarely. It's, it's an exception to the rule when you will see people stop to say grace over their food. That we, we, we honestly don't even acknowledge him anymore that by thy hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. By thy hands, we all are fed. And to say, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we think it's because we work hard that we eat. It is by his grace that he gave you enough health, enough strength, enough sanity of mind to be able to be composed, to go in there so that you don't lose your job. I mean, God is with us. He's with us. And, and I just want to remind you that it can't be an every once in a while kind of a thing, but you need to build God into the routine of your life to where you're building altars, various steps of the way that, Lord, I may not be finished. I may not have arrived yet. My children are not yet grown and out of my house and through school yet. But Father, thank you today that they came home and they were able to get through this particular semester. Father, I thank you. I thank you that I had enough to be able to pay the tuition this semester. Thank you, Jesus, that we were able to make it through this without them calling me up to the school three times. Father, I thank you. You have to start giving God glory for the little things that you see him doing along the way. You have to learn how to just say, Father, I bless you in the name of Jesus. Even though there's craziness happening in my family, even though my sister's doing this, my brother is doing that, my nephew is doing this, my niece is doing that, uh, my uncle is doing this, my aunt is doing that in the name of Jesus. Father, I stand proxy on this altar for my family today. When you build an altar, an altar is a place, it's a point of access. It's an access to the supernatural of God to begin to work in your life and not merely in your life but in your family. And sometimes because of the sacrifices that have been made at altars, entire families have been blessed. Your offspring can be blessed. There are grandchildren today that are living blessed with good jobs and great opportunities that have come their way because they had praying grandmothers and grandfathers who didn't have much at all, but they had a faith in God. They believed in Him that God, even though I don't have much, but I take everything that I have, God, and I present it to you. And I declare to you today in the name of Jesus, it's time for us to begin to build altars in our own heart to say, Lord, I will remember you. I will remember you and lay yourself on the altar. You are the sacrifice. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, God, for you, Lord. Let me just put myself on the altar. I am the sacrifice. Jesus gave himself for us. And then he turned to us and said, now you take up your cross. It's not all about just his cross. He showed us how to carry our cross. Because that cross is going to be your place of sacrifice. Well, you can't do your will. I know your flesh wants to do it, but you can't do everything that your flesh wants to do. We are not here for the aggrandizement of our flesh. 
We're here for the glory of God. And if you'll build the altar a place of remembrance and say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you. I need you, God. And I'm so grateful that those, the power of the altars is a place where he'll say, I'll give you divine acceptance. Here you will find love unconditional into your life. And whatever you present to me there will be a divine transfer and I'll cause transformation on the inside. I'll give you access and acceleration to wonderful and glorious things. And it will be a place in time of reconciliation and repentance. And then the sacrifice that you become right there at that altar. This becomes a divine portal for God to come in and receive the sacrifice to consume it. May you be consumed. With God, may you become like a God drunken man, a God drunken woman, consumed, inebriated, intoxicated by His presence, filled with His praise, giving glory to Him. May you stand proxy for your family, the ones that are living like there is no God, and may we stand proxy for them dedicating our whole families when you're the head of household you have authority to give everything that you have birthed back over to him please remember that you're not going to be saved just because your daddy was saved you are not saved your destiny is not connected to the shoes that you wear but the steps that you take and when you realize God I'm yours I'm yours I belong to you I belong to you and if you will build altars in your heart to say Jesus I know what you've done for me and I will never graduate from the place of altars in my life presenting sacrifices that become like a pleasant aroma in your nostrils it is the sacrifice of our praise our worship it is the sacrifice of our doing good to be able to help others the Bible says with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. If when we want to please him, you die to yourself so that you'll have life in him forevermore. And it's that place that you come and you say, God, without you, I don't know where I would be. Had you not built a gap into my life and revealed your power, your glory, God, woe, woe is me except you come in and fill the gap. God minds the gaps of your life. And every six steps when you fulfill what mankind can do, it becomes a segue in the divine rest of God. For six days shalt thou labor and do all of thy work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And in it thou shalt not do any work you enter into the rest of God because in him do we live and then we move and when you enter into the seventh rest of God you just have your being because God is and you cease from your labor and God is I'm glad today that God is we have our being in him we don't have to do anything just accept what he's already done for us have our being in him in him I live and move and have my being and today we hope that you enjoyed that message don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos and if you want to partner with us click the give now button thank you for what you do